Hello everyone, I am the Meta Kirby, and welcome to my channel, The Commander Timer. The Commander Timer is a channel dedicated to my favorite Magic Gathering format. The Brewery is a series on this channel showcasing my spicy brews and other deck techs. On this episode of The Brewery, I'll be discussing my take on a face commander from the Adventures in the Forgotten Realms Commander Precons, Galia, Kindler of Hope. If you like this deck or any of the cards I'll be mentioning throughout the video, please consider using my TCG Player affiliate link when purchasing those cards. You can find that link down in the description. It'll really help out the channel. The best way you can help support the channel is with my Patreon. For just $1, patrons get early access to certain videos on YouTube. In fact, patrons got a chance to see this video earlier. You can also support my channel for free by simply liking, subscribing, and sharing, which also helps out a lot. You can join my Discord server for free if you want to join the Commander Tyrant community. All pertinent links are down in the description. Alright, let's get back to the episode. Galea is a 4-4 elf knight with vigilance for 1 generic, 1 green, 1 white, and 1 blue. She has 2 static abilities. One of them lets you look at the top card of your library at any time, meaning you can do so when you don't even have priority. Her second static ability is tied to the first one because you can cast auras and equipment from the top of your library. Then, if you do, you can attach that equipment to a creature you control. Essentially, you can cheat the equip cost if you cast them this way. Now, the reason I mention equip cost is because I prefer equipment over auras. I always have. When an enchanted creature dies, an opponent is basically trading 1 for 2 at your disadvantage. But equipment stay behind. Being able to cast equipment from the top of our library also means that we can storm off very quickly, going through our library so long as we have an equipment spell on top of it. So this deck can burn through a ton of equipment, get them all attached to Galia when they enter the battlefield, and then very easily take out an opponent via commander damage. This is why the deck is running all zero costed equipment. Bonesaw, Cathar Shield, Paradise Mantle, Kite Shield, a Quarter Shield, and Spider Silk Net. The equip costs of the shields are a bit steep due to them being free to cast. However, since Galea bypasses the equip cost, she can attach them to any creature, particularly herself, in order to get a considerable boost to the creature's toughness all for zero mana. Bonesaw is a free plus one plus zero which matters when it comes to commander damage. Paradise Mantle turns equipped creature into a mana dork which is still very useful, especially when cast for zero and attached for zero. Moving on to the one costed equipment, there are more vast in terms of numbers than the previously mentioned zero costed ones, considering that those are the only six as of the recording of this video. However, of all of the one costed equipment, only a few of them are amazing. Some of the other ones might seem like filler, but if you reduce their casting cost by one, they become free to cast and then attach, making Galia even stronger. Bone Splitter, Bronze Sword, Dark Steel Axe, Flare Husk, Honed Kapesh, Loyonin Scimitar, Neglected Heirloom, Sigh of the Shinomi, Short Sword, Shuko, Team Pennant, and Trusty Machete are the quote-unquote filler equipment of the deck. These might seem weak in your run-of-the-mill commander deck, but in decks like this one and SRAM, they're absolutely busted. As I mentioned just a moment ago, just reducing their cost by one means able to continuously cast free spells from the top of your library. Then they make Galia even stronger. So don't sleep on these. You also don't have to run the same filler equipment as I do if you'd rather make a larger investment and go for higher costed equipment if you want to go all killer no filler. Brian Blade gives a slight boost in power while also having the creature create a treasure token when it deals combat damage. This might seem more like a filler equipment in the deck, and you wouldn't be wrong, but it's still better than those due to the slight mana acceleration. However, these one costed equipment, Blade of the Blood Sheaf, Bloodforged Battle Axe, Civic Saber, Colossus Hammer, Golem Skill Gauntlets, Great Axe, and Old Naginata are by no means any filler equipment. While I built a deck to maximize how many equipment I can cast off the top of my library to storm off and overwhelm the table in one fell swoop, these are actually pretty good anyways. Blade of the Blood Chief can put plus one plus one counters on Galia even if she's not a vampire. If we're killing off creatures, which we'll soon see how, she can get impressively large, large enough to be a one turn clock much faster. The battle axe is absolutely broken here. We do have to pay the equip cost later on the tokens, but the deck does have ways to circumvent that. So you can exponentially get many copies of this essentially for free. It's beyond busted. Civic Saver isn't as impressive, but it does give Galia plus three plus zero potentially for free. This makes her a three turn clock all on its own. Colossus Hammer outclasses that by giving more than thrice as much. Plus 10 plus 10 on a commander is no joke. Even if we can't free cast it from the top, simply casting it from the top makes Galia attach it to a creature for free. Obviously, we attach it to her and then see opponents sweat. The gauntlets have the potential of making her even stronger. Granted, she needs to have a bunch of equipment attached to her, but that's what all the fillers are for. Great Axe isn't that impressive and is pretty much reliant on equipping it for free onto Galia, but it's still plus 4 plus 0 for just 1 mana, possibly for free. Onaginata is a bit better, although it only pumps plus 3 plus 0. It gives Trample and only costs 2 to equip. Other 1 drops like Basilisk Collar and Shadow Spear are amazing due to their keywords. Death Touch doesn't matter once Galia is ridiculously huge, but it's great for the early game. Giving her lifelink will make it very hard to beat you with burn or combat. 
Shadow Spear has the added bonus of also taking away Hexproof and Indestructible from opponent's creatures. Commander's Plate and Giant's Amulet give some defensive keywords like Protection and Hexproof. The plate gives a whopping plus 3 plus 3 as well as protection from red and black, which are the colors of most removable spells and effects. The amulet can only give hexproof if the equipped creature is untapped, but Kalia has built in vigilance, so that isn't a problem. The only issue with the amulet is that it costs 1 blue to cast, so it can never be free, but it's still just 1 mana to cast, so that's okay. Explorer Scope and Witch's Eye are perhaps some of the most crucial one drop equipments here. Remember that the whole point of the deck is to be able to cast tons of equipment from the top of our library. However, if we get stuck behind a land, we can't keep going. Fortunately, Explorer Scope helps with that. We do have to attack though, but at least we can continue storming off in our post-combat main phase. The Eye can have a scry that land away, or any other non-equipment card, to the bottom of the library. However, it requires tapping. This is one of those equipment you don't want to put a Galia so she can still be available for attacking. Skull Clamp can help in that regards even better since it can be repeated. The deck has a couple of ways of creating 1-1s which are the best creatures to equip Skull Clamp to. Being able to draw any cards from the top that we can't cast is essential to the deck, but just drawing cards is good in a vacuum anyways. We might potentially draw an equipment with our second card, but that's fine, you can just recast it later. But the power of Skull Clamp here is simply busted, even more so when Galia is equipped with Blade of the Blood Chief, like I mentioned earlier. Masterwork of Ingenuity is the second best equipment in the deck in terms of utility. Not only can you cast your best equipment like Golem Skill Gauntlets or Colossus Hammer to copy them, but if opponent has any other equip amazing equipment, we can copy that too, all for just 1 mana or potentially for free. The rest of the equipment in the deck costs more than 1 mana to cast, but they're definitely worth including. Again, you could include much better equipment in the deck and not go for the storm route like I did, but these equipment should be included nonetheless. Nettle Cyst and Belt of Giant Strength are some more ways of making Aaliyah ridiculously large. Nettle Cyst is just stupid good here. It equips onto Galia for free, but even if you don't have Galia, but have a ton of equipment and other artifacts and enchantments at well, it's going to be a huge Phyrexian germ all on its own, for just 3 mana. Belt of Giant Strength technically only pumps Galia plus 6 plus 6 because she's a 4-4 by default, but plus 6 plus 6 for just 2 mana is no joke. Galia even overrides the high equip cost, which is crazy. The only downside to this equipment is never being able to free cast it due to the green mana needed to cast it, but it's still a good include. Hammer of Nizan and Sword of the Realms are great equipment at providing protection for Galia. She might not be that expensive to cast, but Voltron is usually a risky strategy because of it. And not only does the hammer make her indestructible, but she also gets a plus 2 plus 0 boost as well. The sword isn't indestructibility, but at least you can return Galia to your hand if she dies. Now, Sword of the Realms is the backside of Halvar God of Battle, so this card is Halvar when on top of the library. However, MDFCs can be cast as either side when you have the option to cast either. So Galia will in fact let you cast Sword of the Realms off the top of your library, you just can't cast it as Halvar, which is fine because that's not what we wanted anyways. Robe of Stars is another colored equipment that's great to run here. This is perhaps better than the Sword and Hammer because if you keep the mana open, you can phase out Galia in response to any board wipe, negative toughness effects, nax, exile effects, etc. And not only will she be protected into your next untapped step, but anything attached to her phases out as well. So all of your equipment attached to her will also get protected if you phase her out in response to an overloaded Vandal Blast or Cyclonic Rift. She also keeps any plus one plus one counters you put on her too. This equipment is just crazy good here, even if you can't cast it entirely for free. Champion's Helm and Swiftfoot Boots are the ubiquitous protective equipment in the format, so their inclusion here is no surprise. Champion's Helm is chosen over Lightning Greaves because if Galia had Shroud, you would not be able to attach any other equipment to her because equipping an equipment is a targeted effect, so keep that in mind if you're planning to build Galia. The only aura I would run it in this deck is Crossland Adaptation due to how high our storm count is going to be. So for just one green mana, the amount of instances of plus one plus zero Galia can get is going to be insane. It's a shame that it isn't legal in Commander though. This would literally be the only aura here, but I digress. Okay, so I keep mentioning storming off and casting these equipment spells for free. So let's see exactly how we're going to go about that. Ethereum Sculptor, Foundry Inspector, and Jurious Familiar are no brainers here since they reduce the cost of all of our artifact spells by one. So even one of them is enough to help us free cast almost all of the artifacts in the deck. Having them all will naturally help us storm off almost guaranteed. The familiar is even better here since it also reduces the cost of our legendary creatures of which the deck has a couple besides Galia. Danitha Capuchin Paragon being one of them is another cost reduction effect but she's only limited to aura and equipment spells which is by no means a problem in this deck. So she provides great redundancy. She's also an excellent body to put a bunch of equipment on since she already has first strike, vigilance and lifelink by default. 
Inspiring Statuary and Urza Lord High Artificer don't provide outright cost reduction per se, but they allow us to accelerate our deck by tapping down artifacts for mana acceleration. The Statuary turns our equipment into ways of paying for the generic cost of our non-artifact spells, while Urza turns all of our equipment and other artifacts into mox sapphires. So even if we don't have any cost reducers in play, we can pay for those one drop equipment on the top of our library with the equipment that we just had entered. So we can potentially keep chaining into more. If that weren't enough, Urza creates a 0-0 token whose power and toughness are each equal to the amount of artifacts we control. So this is an amazing body to carry a ton of equipment, and potentially a larger threat than Galia or Danatha. If that weren't enough, Urza also helps us get past any card on the top of our library that we can't cast with Galia. We simply pay 5, shuffle our library, and then free cast whatever's on top. While this in and of itself is busted, we don't have that many expensive spells in the deck. The only bummer would be revealing Cyclonic Rift afterwards since it's the only instant in the deck and we'd rather overload this to clear the board for our Voltron creatures to get through. But since all of our protective effects are on permanence, any other card revealed by Urza isn't a problem to free cast after paying 5 generic mana to do so. The key thing was having shuffled our library. We've already seen a couple of these top deck manipulation solutions in the deck, but it has many more that we're going to see in a bit. The final ways we can accelerate our deck is the conventional mana acceleration provided by rocks like Soul Ring and Mana Crypt, as well as ramp spells like my favorite Tyfecta of Farseek, Nature's Lore, and Three Visits. The rocks are not just ubiquitous but also synergize with the deck. Ramping lands is also important because they thin the deck of lands, which is why all 10 fetch lands are also included. We don't even need to crack these right away since the deck has such a low average CMC. We can keep one around in case we need to shuffle our deck due to having a non-equipment spell on the top of our library. We can even make the most of the fetch lands with Urborg to move Yawgmoth and Yamamaya Cradle of Growth. Since they are now either swamps and or forests, we can actually tap them for mana in a pinch if we want to cast something without shuffling our library to search for a land. So these two lands are actually more useful than you'd think in this particular deck. Ursa Saga is another land that can fetch for something, albeit an artifact that costs 0 or 1 to cast. We can't really control when it happens, but at least we can use it to get the best 0 or 1 drop from our library in terms of artifacts. If that weren't enough, before it gets sacrificed away, we have the potential of creating up to two more constructs that are as big as the amount of artifacts we control. So this land is also an amazing one in this deck. It gives us more amazing bodies to attach a ton of equipment to. As for the rest of the top deck manipulation effects I mentioned earlier, as well as peppered throughout the video, Mystic Forge, Sensei's Dividing Top, and Jace the Mind Sculptor also help in that regard. It has more or less the same abilities as Galia, except that we can cast artifacts and colorless spells from the top, not just ours and equipment. However, we want to cast equipment with Galia to get that free attachment when they enter the battlefield that way. But the Forge is yet another effect in the deck to get past any blocks on the top of our library. Granted, we can only do it once because it requires tapping, but if we combine it with the top, we can just use the top to draw that block and then cast the top from the top of our library with the Forge. If we reduce the top's cost to zero, we'll never be blocked. Jace can only do his Brainstorm effect once a turn, but it's still powerful nonetheless. We can draw the top three cards and then put two back on top preferably equipment spells. That way we can cheat any equip cost for any equipment in our hand if we top deck them first and then cast them from there with Galia. His plus 2 can also just bottom deck away any block we have there, but the zero loyalty ability would be better in this case. He can also bounce a creature so his other abilities are still relatively relevant here. Academy Ruins is another way to get an equipment on the top of our library if it was in our graveyard. So not only can this land, which doesn't take up a slot on the deck, help us recover any artifacts in our graveyard, but it does so by top decking it. Remember that we can also just draw those non-equipment cards off the top of our library too. Shimmer Dragon is perhaps the strongest effect in that aspect after Sensei's Divining Top. We can just tap down two equipment to draw a card, which is insane in this deck. Remember, the goal is to storm off as quickly as possible and set up a winning board state afterwards. We don't want to get stuck behind non-equipment cards, but we also want to be able to always cast them. Which is why the deck is full of equipment spells and ways to reduce their cost to zero and manipulate the top of our library. SRAM, Senior Edificer, and Vidalkin Archmage can also help in drawing cards, but only when we cast something. SRAM draws a card whenever we cast an equipment spell, while the Archmage does so regardless of what type of artifact we're casting. These might seem like they prevent us from storming off since we can potentially draw equipment that followed an equipment we just cast. However, if the next card wasn't an equipment, then casting that second equipment from our hand will draw that non-equipment card. So they still help us deal with potentially running out of steam. Any equipment cast from our hand won't benefit from Galia's effect, but the deck is also running Sigarda's Aid for redundancy. Not only can we attach any equipment that enters the battlefield without paying any equip cost, but we can also cast equipment at instant speed, so we don't even need to storm off during our own turn. We can do so at the beginning of the end step before our turn. Tidal Barracuda also helps in this regard. 
Not only can we cast our spells as if they had flash, but then once it's our turn, we can't be interrupted. Keep in mind though that if you try storming off with the Barracuda, opponents can still cast spells as if they had flash at that moment too, so it might be good for some of our spells, but keep that in mind. The Barracuda is mostly to protect our own turn from opponents' interactions so as to storm off in peace, so don't use the Barracuda to cast spells at the end of an opponent's turn. Ardid Intrepid Archaeologist and Pure Steel Paladin are more redundant effects in terms of equipping things for free. Arden relies on the combat step but at least we can attach all of our equipment however we want to any number of creatures we want. So we can super equip a 0-0 construct token, Galia, or even Shimmer Dragon since it's a 4-4 flyer with potential hexproof. The Paladin makes our equip cost 0 so we don't need to rely on any particular trigger so long as it's one of our main phases. Fortunately, Leon and Shikari gets past any timing restrictions. This creature is amazing here, especially against instant speed responses. We can just respond by moving our protective equipment around, so it's definitely amazing here. Sign Master Thoptris and Efficient Construction are the final pieces of some puzzles since they're the other cards responsible for getting us Skull Clamp fodder. However, not only that, but they're flyers too, which make them great at carrying a ton of equipment. Keep in mind also that Voltron decks tend to be weak to Horde decks, so being able to create a ton of chump blockers is also a good way to deter other swarms of creatures coming our way. The rest of the deck is just the rest of the lands. The deck's running all 3 dual lands, all 3 shock lands, all 3 battle bond lands, command tower, reflecting pool, exotic orchard, city of brass, mana confluence, ancient tomb, and shrine of the forsaken gods, as well as one of each basic land. As with all my deck techs, the original dual lands, the more expensive fetch lands, and mana crypt aren't entirely necessary for the deck to run, and you can just as easily swap them out for any budget substitutes and the deck will still run well enough. This brew is just an idea of how to build around Galia Kindler of Hope. This deck is very similar to the SRAM deck I built about a year ago, which you can find a link to here. However, unlike SRAM, you can add blue and green, making Galia potentially better than SRAM for an equipment storm deck. Although you can draw cards with SRAM, it doesn't matter with Galia if you're able to cast them from the top of the library anyways. So you get more benefits beyond the extra colors, since the equipment also entered the battlefield attached to a creature you control. This is why I built a similar strategy to SRAM since it already worked so well. But Galia is way more efficient and also more dangerous since she can very easily become a huge threat. And not only her, but the other creatures as well. So if you're able to burn through most of your library, you can have a huge attacker for each opponent and take them out in one false swoop. I would like to thank all my patrons for supporting me and a quick shout out to all my higher tier patrons, the Brewers, for their patronage. I'd also like to thank anyone using my TCG Player affiliate link, that also helps out the channel. And to everyone, thanks for watching this episode of The Brewery on the Commander Tavern. I'm the Method Kirby, and happy brewing!